Welcome to the Space Telescope Public Lecture Series. Tonight's talk, Spacefarers, How Humans Will Settle the Moon, Mars, and Beyond. I'm Dr. Frank Summers, your host for this evening. And I wanna thank our wonderful tech team, Thomas Marufu and Grant Justice, who are taking this and streaming it out to you for you to watch. Uh, I will note that we will be online only until further notice, and that will probably last throughout 2021. There really hasn't been any decision on this, uh, on this yet. We know we will stay online through the summer. We'll see about the fall. Our upcoming talks. Next month, we have a very special one for you. On May 4th, Finding the Music of the Spheres, Hearing Stars. This is from the Consonance Collective and the Bergamont Quartet from the Peabody Institute here in Baltimore. They have collaborated with the Space Telescope Science Institute to write music inspired by astronomical images. They will talk about their compositions as well as play some music for you. Now, I wanna warn you, this one was probably gonna go long. We have several different composers and several different pieces to play. So we're probably going to go for about two hours next month. Normally we stop at 90 minutes, but I think we're probably gonna go for about two hours, but this will be a special event and I'm sure you'll wanna see it. In June, we will have a talk about exoplanets by Emily Rickman here at the Space Telescope Science Institute. And in July, Quinn Hart, who did uh, this talk last year, Armchair Astrophysics, is going to come back with a second version of Armchair Astrophysics. It will not be the same things that she talked about last year. Uh, she said she had you know, so much she could have talked about last year that she's going to do a you know, like follow on to her talk last year. If you wanna know about our talks, upcoming talks, you can go to our website, uh, www.stsci.edu slash public hyphen lectures will get you there. Uh, and on our page, you can see on the left-hand side, the links to our webcasts, both on the uh, our YouTube playlist, as well as the webcast archive uh, housed by the Space Telescope Science Institute. Uh, on the right, you can see how to subscribe to our lecture announcements if you want uh, just one or two emails a month reminding you of these, of these presentations. Also, we have the upcoming lectures, the uh, things, and if you click those read more buttons, uh, you will get to the complete details of, about the uh, lecture, uh, the description of it, as well as after it has been recorded, the link to the STSCI webcast that you can see at the top, and the link to the YouTube webcast there on the bottom. Uh, email. Well, as I've already said, sign up at the website. Um, very easy to do, but you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash Hubble Space Telescope. And if you're watching this on YouTube, hey, that's the channel you're watching. Uh, if you subscribe, then you'll get new video notices and reminders of these live events. Finally, if you have comments or questions, you can send them to the email public lecture at stsci.edu. Space Telescope Science Institute runs several social media channels for the Hubble Space Telescope for the James Webb Space Telescope that will be launching this fall, and for the Space Telescope Science Institute itself. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on YouTube, we're on Instagram at the handles provided there. Myself, I do a tiny bit of social media on Facebook and Twitter as Dr. Frank Summers. And now the news from the universe for April, 2021. Our first story, the dim prospects of a bright star. So let's start in this region of the sky. Now, as you can see in the lower right, I've circled the constellation of Orion. And uh, that's a very famous constellation that sort of orients you on the sky. And Orion is the hunter. And he is accompanied by his two hunting dogs, Canis Major and Canis Minor. Canis Major is the big dog. And the dog star, the brightest star in Canis Major, is Sirius. Now, many of you may know that that is the brightest star on the night sky, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the brightest star anywhere. It happens to be a pretty bright star, 
but it also is really, really, really close. That's why it appears bright to us. A really, really bright star, one of the brightest stars in the Milky Way, is just to the left. Um, and it's circled and, and it's called VY Canis Majoris. All right. And so let's tell you a little bit about VY Canis Majoris. It's a red hypergiant star. It's huge. This is an evolved star, okay? Um, it's 300,000 times more luminous than our sun. Yeah, much, much, much brighter than our sun. It's also much, much, much bigger than our sun. It's 1,400 times larger than our sun. How big is that? Well, that is so large that on this scale diagram, the sun has been there the entire time and you haven't noticed it. That's how tiny the sun is. Let me zoom in and you can see, here's the sun compared to VY Canis Majoris, yes. VY Canis Majoris is one of the biggest and one of the brightest stars out there. So it's an interesting star just in its own right, but it's also interesting in its light curve, okay? This is a historical light curve. It goes all the way back to 1800 and all the way up to 2020. So as you've got over 200 years of light curve here, and I've, you'll notice that the plots are a little shifted. Well, that's because one of them measures visual magnitude, one of them measures blue magnitude, and one of them measures V-band magnitude. And they're slightly different, but they have to be shifted around to match, okay? Uh, but what you can see that is since the early 1800s through to today, VY Canis Majoris has dimmed a lot, okay? It's, it's dimmed by a couple magnitudes. Um, and also, you can see that it's very variable, that it brightens and then it dims, and it brightens and then it dims, all right? So it's got this history of this, all right? And previous studies have figured out that this history is due to ejections of material, that VY Canis Majoris, this star in its older age, is spewing out material. And those clouds of material can sometimes get in our way and block the light and dim it. So what they wanted to do was study those ejections in detail. And so who are you gonna call? You're gonna call Hubble. And so looking in deep and close at VY Canis Majoris, Hubble was able to get this image of it. Now, there's all sorts of stuff around it. This is material that has been spewed out of VY Canis Majoris. And, you know, some people don't quite know where the star is, so I'll point it out to you. It's that bright white dot there, okay? And so the researchers then took spectra along lines of sight around the star to examine some of these ejected knots and filaments and, and clouds and structures. And they could measure the velocity of those clouds and then figure out when they had been ejected. So something that I didn't mention when I showed you that light curve is that they're figuring out when these ejections happened from the spectra and then going back to the light curve and figuring out, ah, this is when this knot was ejected from the star. They're going back and they're doing the forensics of eruptions that happened, you know, 30 years ago or 70 years ago or even 150 years ago. They're actually being able to measure, all right, this clump of gas was ejected during this, um, this variation in the light curve. And that's really kind of cool that you can go back after the fact and take a look at the historical light curve and match it to the physical structures that you're seeing in the clouds around it. So we're able to go in really close, take a look at VY Canis Majoris. Um, but I got to tell you, you don't actually see the star itself. You see all the stuff around it. But as in the middle image here, you can see all the, all the we see of the star itself is this big white blob. So to give people an idea of what you might see, uh, we had one of our wonderful artists do an illustration, uh, which is what you see on the right-hand side here, of uh, an illustration of the VY Canis Majoris, this red hypergiant star with all sorts of activity that's billowing things and will continue to do so, at least for another few million years until it either goes supernova or it collapses to a black hole. So the future is a quite interesting for VY Canis Majoris, and we'll continue to watch it and see all, all, all of its amazing uh, eruptions. 
The second story we have for you is double quasars in merging galaxies. All right, so let's let's unpack that. First of all, we've got galaxies, right? This is uh, one of the famous galaxies, galaxies Messier 100. It's a beautiful spiral galaxy. And um, in the cores of all large galaxies, we believe there exist supermassive black holes, okay? So giant black holes that are millions to billions to, you know, uh, times the mass of our sun live in the cores of galaxies. And if material falls into these supermassive black holes, well, then stuff gets spewed out at really high energies. And if you see that spew from that supermassive black hole, you might see something called a quasar, right? And quasar originally meant quasi-stellar radio source. We've actually changed it recently to be QSO, quasi-stellar object, which is really what it is. It looks like a star, but it's not. Look, you can see the diffraction spikes here on this quasar, right? But it's in another galaxy. It's really, really far away. It's not a star. It's something that just looks as bright as a star, but it's really, really far away. How do we know these are in galaxies? Well, for some QSOs, we can actually find the galaxy itself behind it. So here you can see that little diffraction spikes there, that, that bright point in the center of this spiral galaxy. But you can also, by looking in the infrared, see the spiral arms of that galaxy. That's actually kind of rare. You rarely, you, usually you cannot see the, the galaxy behind it, but in some cases, well. so we confirmed that these quasars exist in distant galaxies. All right, that's part one. Part two is we also know that galaxies merge together. Uh, this is an image of the two merging galaxies called ESO 148, two galaxies that are smashing together and swirling up. And so the cores of these galaxies are now mixing together. So shouldn't it follow that if there's a quasar in a galaxy and a quasar in, a, in another galaxy, and those two galaxies merge together, that you could find a double quasar in merging galaxies. So those are really, really, really difficult to find, okay? So they defined this amazing search strategy. First of all, they found quasars. Quasars, uh, the Sloan survey has a list of quasars, and they found the very distant ones, what are called the high redshift ones, greater than redshift of two. So you get really distant that way that the emission from the galaxies behind them is actually minimal. So you'll only see the two bright dots, right? Then these two quasars are so close together that the Gaia satellite would, would, confirm, would think of them as just one object. But these two quasars are variable in their light and they would not be synchronized. So actually the center that Gaia measures would actually shift around a little bit. So you look for Gaia, the, you, you take the, the positions where the quasars are in Sloan, you look for variability in the Gaia position due to these quasars uh, variability, and then you say, there you have your candidates. They ended up with 15 candidates and four were observed by Hubble. They found two sets of double quasars. This is really cool. That those are two bright quasar spots that Gaia would look at and see just one, one thing, but Hubble can resolve and see it as two quasars. And the supposition here that hasn't been proven yet, is that these are in merging galaxies. Because how else are you going to get two quasars in, in real close? Uh, we've never seen galaxies that have multiple quasars, you know, uh, a single galaxy that forms multiple quasars. So the idea is that these would be merging galaxies, and we'll see the quasars uh, in, as, in the core as the galaxies are getting together. But here, this is also uh, kind of unsatisfying, because all you get to see are the bright, bright quasar dots. You know, it was chosen so that the galaxy's uh, emission would actually be minimal. So we take that idea of emerging galaxies and ESO 148, um, and we combine it with the two bright dots. And we did the calculations on our, how far apart would the galaxy bright dots be at this at this distance when it scaled to this galaxy and everything. And an illustrator came up with this, our double quasars illustration.
okay? So it gives you the idea of these two merging galaxies long, long ago and the two quasars in the center. Uh, in truth, it's not quite the, uh, uh, what the eye would, what, what and any telescope would see, because the quasars would actually be a lot brighter. They'd blow out most of the galaxy, but it's an illustration to kind of guide your eye, put it in your head that these are two quasars in merging galaxies, probably about nine or 10 billion light years away. Now we go to our featured speaker tonight. Uh, let me stop my screen share. Our featured speaker tonight is Christopher Wanjek, um, and he is a health and science writer based in Baltimore. Uh, he holds a master's degree in health from Harvard School of Public Health and a bachelor's degree in journalism from Temple University. So journalism, health, man, that's perfect for the, the health and science writer. Uh, he's written more than 500 newspaper, magazine, and website articles uh, for all sorts of famous periodicals. Um, and for, from 1998 to 2007, he was even a senior writer at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. He has, is the author of three books, and the one he's going to tell you about tonight, Spacefarers, uh, has received critical acclaim, and he tells me he got one reviewer to say, I don't know how much he paid him, but he got this one reviewer to say, the best book on space exploration since Isaac Asimov. Whoa, that's a, that's, that's a pretty good comment. Um, I always ask my speakers for one interesting tidbit of what they do in their spare time when they're not doing their job. Um, and Christopher says he likes to hang out behind the Space Telescope Science Institute building. Uh, not because the building is there, uh, because he's a forager. Um, and he looks for mushrooms and other, other wild things out there. And the, the park behind the, uh, the Institute obviously is a good place. Who knew? So, ladies and gentlemen, Christopher Wanjek. Excellent. Thank you for that, Frank. Let me get my... <clears throat> presentation up. Okay. All right, is that showing, Frank? I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> Looks okay. Good. And I'm not, okay, I'm not muted. All right. So, hey, thank you. Uh, absolutely, thank you. This is uh, wonderful, you know, to think of myself giving a talk at the Space Science uh, Lecture Hall however remote and virtual, it's, it's a humbling experience. I mean, I, I've been an audience member so many times myself listening to you know, the greats like uh, John Mather, Alan Stern, um, Mario Livio, Adam Reese, uh, great science communicators like Ray Villard and uh, Hannah Wakefield. So for me to be included in this lecture series is really uh, an honor. So thank you for everyone uh, inviting me. I have to say also I'm a, a, a little intimidated. I know this is a public lecture, uh, but I know members of this particular public <laughs> are real space aficionados, uh, e wearers of uh, uh, Star Trek paraphernalia. So, uh, you know, I know a lot of you know astronomy and engineering better than I do. In fact, I don't doubt there are people in the audience that I actually came to to interview for my book, Spacefarers. Um, but I hope I can impart to you uh, my perspective as a health writer and also as someone I would describe as a, uh, an optimistic skeptic uh, about living in space. So let me move on. And I know we're supposed to get our financial disclosures uh, out, of, out of the way there because I might be talking up more as a little later. I'm going to start on um, Mount Everest. And uh, I do that because, you know, we can reach the top of Mount Everest with relative ease now. About you know more than four thousand people have been to the top, uh, compared to only four hundred people in space. And um, despite this relative ease of getting to the summit, um, despite the the fantastic view, no one's living. On, you know, no one chooses to live on top of Mount Everest. It's it's not practical, right? I mean, what are you going to do for a living? You know, how are you going to raise your kids? Air is kind of thin. You know, it sounds obvious, but when we talk about living on the moon forever, you know, and, and moving and, and migrating to Mars. You know, what are, how practical is that despite the, the gorgeous view from there? Um, I mean, what would be the economic and the uh, emotional motivations to get us there? 
This will be a migration like never before. I would imagine that most of this audience tonight is in the United States and think about yourself here. Either you or, or someone in your family came here to the United States for economic or emotional motivations, you know, maybe religious motivations a couple hundred years ago. And they didn't come here just because someone invented a boat, right? <laughs> and likewise, we're not going to go to Mars just because someone invents a rocket. Now, you know, that said, I do think we're going to be on the moon in a scenario that looks like this in about 10 or 15 years with science bases absolutely happening. We're going to be on Mars maybe in 20, 25 years with a simple scenario like this. Will we be living in orbit in these uh, you know, rotating habitats with artificial gravity and climate control? Maybe. I, I can think of some emotional and economic reasons for, for doing this kind of thing, and I'll get to that later in the talk. Here's how we're going to get there. We're going to drive. Um, I, I joke, of course, but th this is a real photograph, a selfie, if you will, of a Tesla launched by SpaceX in 2019 to demonstrate the strength of its Falcon Heavy rocket. This, this, this car <laughs> and the mannequin is whipping around Mars as we speak. That's, that's fantastic. And, and I like this picture because it, for me, it's, it's symbolic of how companies like SpaceX are now the driving force of, of, of space exploration. They are making money in space. Other companies are making money in space, business to business. And this has never happened before. This is new in, in this recent decade. It's not uh, governments handing over lots of money to government to uh, military contractors anymore. Businesses are involved and we're gonna be starting to see some real innovation. That's the most exciting thing. So let's get back to why we're doing it. Because this is an important question. Um, you know, I think the reasons that people voice are the wrong reasons and they don't help us whatsoever in, in recruiting more people to our movement. Um, you know, it's all this doom and gloom. We have to get off this planet. We have to be a multi-planet species or else go extinct. Even Stephen Hawking said that, right? He said, we have 100 years, the physicist, the great physicist. He said, we had 100 years to get off the planet earth or face extinction. And I think this is a ludicrous idea because, I mean, when you think about it, there is, there is nothing that can happen to the earth that would make it less habitable than any other place in this solar system. Uh, I mean, let's, let's go through the, the, you know, the top reasons that people give, like the population problem. You know, first off, you know, offloading a billion people to Mars, how, however impossible that would be, that's not going to hardly dent the population on Earth. And I personally don't think there are too many people on Earth. I think there's too much inefficiency. That's the real problem. I mean, you think about it, we, we waste half the food we grow. We, we waste upwards to, of half the electricity in these leaky electrical grids. All the trash we don't recycle, all the fertilizer we let run into the ocean. These are major uh, engineering issues that we can overcome and then allow uh, with space resources, billions more people living on this planet. And I think that's a good thing. I am pro-life, pro-people in this regard. More people mean more inventors, more entrepreneurs, more ideas. That's for the betterment of society. I would love to see that more people on earth. Uh, the pandemic issue. I don't want to be glib here. I mean, we're in the middle, one, the middle of a pandemic right now. I, I personally know several people who have died, uh, including a family member. Um, but it's not an existential threat to humanity. Let's face it, a virus has never wiped out humans before, obviously. So why would that happen now all of a sudden, this age of uh, DNA uh, sequencing and vaccine development? Doesn't seem to make much sense there. Nuclear war, asteroid strike, they're, they're kind of the same thing when you think about it, some horrible bombardment from the sky. But again, not to be clip, <laughs> that won't kill everyone. Even the most conservative estimates leave hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions of people uh, around to survive in these well fortified underground bunkers or even in uh, abandoned supermarkets living off of canned beans and spam. I mean, we're smarter than the dinosaurs. We'll see something coming and try to protect ourselves and many will survive to, to continue the human race. Civilization will be set back a hundred years or so. I'm not advocating for this but it won't wipe out humans as we speak. And here's the old logic of it. You know, if we were living on Mars in some self-sufficient way, where you don't need the earth, 
If we had that technology to live on Mars that way, well, we would have the technology to detect and deflect an asteroid, end of story. <laughs> Uh, likewise, with climate change, the, uh, you know, definitely real. It's the worst uh, uh, issue facing the Earth right now, I, I, I truly believe, in the threat to life. Uh, it'll get worse before it gets better, but it'll get better. But nonetheless, if we were on Mars, same logic, if we were on Mars with the technology to be self-sufficient, obviously we would have mastered the ability to live in these mini Earths. And if we could do that on Mars, we would be doing that on Earth to save our species. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you could terraform Mars, you would terraform Earth back into Earth <laughs> the way it was supposed to be. So that leads to me only like this one possible scenario of, you know, of, of what could happen that we would have to be elsewhere in the, in the universe. And that's, you know, if an alien force comes by and, and vaporizes Earth to build an intergalactic superhighway. So yeah, kind of jokey there, but this is a, a real problem because a lot of you get this issue a lot of times with members of the public coming and saying, you know, why are we spending billions of dollars in space when we have all these problems on Earth? Well, yeah, <laughs> that's why we're going into space to solve these problems on Earth, to tap into those space resources. We're already doing that now, aren't we, with communication satellites and weather satellites, Earth monitoring satellites so we understand how much we messed up this planet. That's important stuff. Let's keep this going. If we can access space more easily, well, we could augment energy production. We could be putting solar panels in space where there's never a cloudy day. We could even put supercomputers in space where they would operate far more efficiently at, at, in the cold of space in 40 Kelvin. We could be building these interesting molecules in zero gravity. And, you know, and then, uh, then we can talk about going to the moon and Mars, and, and, but it's gonna be done in the context of having fun. And, and science and exploration, not you know, because life on Earth uh, absolutely depends on our living on another pl uh, planet. So here's the biggest problem, and everyone knows this, is getting off the Earth, right? That first 100 kilometers, it's not just a matter of going up. You gotta go up and over at like a tremendous speed, you know, eight kilometers per second, it takes a lot of energy. That's fast, you know, that's going from space telescope down to the inner harbor in Baltimore in, in, a, in a snap. Really fast, you need a lot of energy. So when you see these rockets, when you see a, a rocket here, you gotta keep in mind, that only about two or 5% of the mass is the actual payload, what you wanna put in space. The rest, the 95 plus percent, that's all metal and fuel to push the thing up there. And then it just disappears. That's why it's so expensive and inefficient to get things into space. You know, Elon Musk and SpaceX, they've, they've lowered the price considerably. And that's, that's great. It's, you know, to get it down much lower, it's, it's an open-ended question here. You know, there might be some incredible fuels coming down the line. We can talk about it later in the question uh, part of this talk about the metallic hydrogen, which was isolated in the lab at Harvard. And uh, that would have a tremendous kick. And you might be able to get down to maybe uh, $2 a kilogram, because that's like 100 times more powerful at that point. That would be exciting if you could stabilize it, but that's a big if. Regardless, if we want to get, if we want to be a spacefaring people, if we want to get tens of thousands of people into space each and every day, just like we get people in the air via airplanes, we want to get that many people into space, we're going to have to get away from rockets. It's not just because they're inefficient, and it's not just because they're polluting. Think about the noise. <laughs> Imagine tens of thousands of rocket launches every day. I can't believe no one's ever talking about this. I, I mean, the coming and going and the sonic booms would just be maddening. We're eventually going to have to build a highway into space. So you, forgive me why I, I venture into the future here for these next couple of slides. I'll get this back to reality. So, you know, one idea is the space elevator. And, uh, and I feel that I can't see you out there, but I feel half the audience is saying, ooh, space elevator, what's that? And the other half is saying, oh, no, not the space elevator idea. You know, so what this is, and I, it's fascinating. I just don't think it can work on Earth. So this is a cable, of course, that stretches into space, and you can just climb up slowly on this cable. And it's held tight, you know, the same force if you have a ball at the end of rope and you're whipping that ball around, that string will stay, that rope will stay tight as long as you keep on moving it around. Well, in this case, you have a space station at the end of a cable and you have the earth, which is rotating. And this space station, of course, is out way out there, geosynchronous orbit, okay? That's 36,000 kilometers away. So the first problem is we don't have a cable that strong <laughs> that won't snap under its own weight. Steel and Kevlar won't do it. 
carbon nanotubes maybe, but you need, you know, our longest carbon nanotube is only about a meter long and you're gonna need 36 million of them. But the real issue is where on earth are you gonna put this thing? Um, I mean, you would have to protect it. I mean, let's, let's face it, you have to protect it from terrorism, right? Because <laughs> you know some nuts gonna to wanna to bring this whole thing down. Uh, but also more menacing, you have all that space junk in, in low, low Earth orbit, and, and that's going to be constantly crashing into this cable, destabilizing the whole thing. So, I mean, this could work on Mars, it might work on the moon, but I just don't think it's going to work on the Earth. And, and that's okay. We've got a nifty idea here, kind of an intermediate step. It's a space hook. So you could build this. It's exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> These would be uh, satellites with essentially cables dangling into the upper atmosphere. And you could build this with modern, uh, with, well, modern materials today. You don't need any fancy cabling. Um, and essentially you could connect um, cargo to that with a high altitude balloon or a, a high altitude airplane and then flip it into space. Uh, quite feasible, you could get a lot of stuff into space this way for relatively cheap uh, once you get this uh, infrastructure built. And that gets us to a grand idea Again, I know it sounds really futuristic, but someday this is going to make sense. Um, in the same way that the interstate highway system started to make sense in the 1950s, that was a $500 billion investment to connect cities for cars, but it was an investment that paid off six to one in terms of the commerce it produced. Well, likewise, with a ring around the entire planet, you know how Saturn has its ring of ice? This would be a, a ring of metal you would send up tubes, maybe with the sky hooks, send up tubes one after the other, fuse them together to a forms a ring around the whole planet. And then you magnetize the thing. Um, so it's rotating at orbital velocity and it's magnetized. It becomes a bit like a, a maglev rail. And at that point, you could levitate a platform above it. The platform would be still, it's the rail underneath it that's moving. It's a train in reverse a bit. And so you could stand on that platform, you would be at orbital altitude, but not orbital velocity. And you would feel the whole you know, gravity of the earth below you, more or less. Uh, and you could have space planes up there launching off to the moon or destinations in between earth and moon. Um, it sounds fantastic, it is fantastic, but at some point this will make sense because that'll be the way to get tens of thousands of people into space each and every day. Okay, let's snap back to reality here. The International Space Station, that's our total existence in space right now. I think there's six people on there right now, maybe seven. Um, so this thing cost 150 to, uh, billion to build. Um, it cost at least 4 billion to maintain each year. It's only seen about 240 visitors. So that's like a half a billion dollars per visitor, clearly not sustainable. You can tell by the tone of my voice that I, I'm not a big fan of the International Space Station. I think it's good for perhaps surprising reasons to you. I think it was excellent way for us to team up with Russia and other nations in space. That was a major advancement beyond the engineering, just that, that connection to those countries. That was one of the greatest things about this uh, International Space Station. Um, we've also learned how to dock and maneuver in space, very important. But you know these experiments that they do on zero gravity, I think are really short-sighted in my opinion. Uh, it's, they act, we act as if zero gravity is in our future. <laughs> when this is just a blip, you know, a 20 year blip in, in humanity, our future is in artificial gravity and uh, the low gravity of the moon and Mars. We're not gonna be traveling around everywhere in zero gravity, you know? So we know zero gravity is bad for your health. That's all we need to know. We don't need to know how to sequence DNA in zero gravity. We don't care if ants can reproduce in zero gravity. It does nothing for our future in space because the future is going to be in artificial gravity. So here's one of the most exciting things uh, I have ever seen on the International Space Station, an inflatable habitat. It was put there by Bigelow Aerospace in 2015 by a SpaceX, SpaceX rocket, that business to business transaction. And it's still there today and they use it as storage. And this is step one, this is step two right here. These will be free floating expandable habitats. And here's Bigelow down here. And these are called his, um, his B330s. And that stands for 330 cubic meters of volume, which is more volume, livable volume than the whole International Space Station. And he's building these for a few tens of millions of dollars, 
not 150 billion. And I think right now, I, I think you're looking at the near future of low earth orbit. These are going to be a relatively low cost uh, microgravity factories and microgravity laboratories and even space hotels. That was, that was Bigelow's original intent. Um, he wanted to, he's going, he plans to rent these out for $60 million a month uh, with a lot of money, but there's a market for this with ultra rich people and also movie producers, music video producers to film uh, up in space. That would generate a lot of excitement. And it's the, it's the first step to these grander space resorts you may have heard about with a, an external rotating gravity component and then a central uh, microgravity for the fun of it. And you would sleep and eat out here in, in this civilized manner. Um, that's the next step here. And you know the only drag is that um, the pandemic really has set him back, Bigelow. Uh, he's talking to some NASA folks right here, but um, he was planning to launch this within a couple of years, but he's had to lay off his entire uh, workforce because of the pandemic. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Nevertheless, I think expandable habitats like this, which are quite inexpensive to build, uh, are, are in our near future. So eventually we'll get to the moon. And um, uh, I say eventually, cause you know, who knows when, but you know, NASA has this plan to be there, put humans back by 2024, which is, you know, no one at NASA even I think was realizing that's gonna happen. It was a, a ridiculous deadline set by the previous administration purely out of ego. But it was a, it's a bad idea too, cause in my opinion, it is, you really don't want to rush humans back to the moon. They can't really do anything there. If you want permanence on the moon, uh, which is what China and, and Russia are planning, <laughs> um, you, you need to set up infrastructure. And I'll get to that in a second. What I think is interesting about the moon is I, I, I predict it's going to be a lot like what we do in Antarctica. And you might know in Antarctica, no one owns Antarctica, um, but there are, are science bases down there, about 70 of them run by dozens of countries. And you have um, scientists that go down there for maybe two, three months at a time, usually in the summer. And then you have a hardy crew that stays over winter, maybe a year or two, and then they come back. You're gonna find, I think, the moon a lot like that, where you'll have nation-led bases visited by scientists uh, going for a couple months at a time, and maybe a year-round crew, depending on how we could hold up in that uh, microgravity of, of 16, 17% of Earth's gravity. Maybe it's suitable for a year. We don't know. Um, and here's the fascinating thing. Pure coincidence, the first place we're going to go, the most logical place to go, would be the south pole of the moon. Um, because there's a constant temperature there of a, of a minus 50 degrees Celsius, which is cold, but workable. Elsewhere on the moon, see the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. So the temperature fluctuates so greatly because there's nothing to trap and circulate the heat. So during the lunar day, which will last 14 Earth days, sun hits the surface and it'll heat up the surface to over 120 degrees Celsius, you know, 200 plus degrees uh, Fahrenheit. You know, that'll boil your blood. And then at nighttime, when there's no sun, it gets down to a, a minus 200 degrees uh, Celsius. So that, that it's all but impossible to be working there month after month. But on the moon, the North Pole and the South Pole get that steady, shallow uh, angle of sunlight as it's rotating. And uh, most of the time, there's, there's sunlight. In fact, that's what's the fun part. Some of these craters, uh, the rims of the craters are high enough that there's actually perpetual sunlight. The sun never sets. And you could set up solar panels there for constant energy. That would be a huge boon. And then as an added bonus, you see these shadowed areas over here. Um, these are areas with ice deposits that haven't seen the light of day for millions of years. And if you could harvest that ice, which is a big if, and we can talk about that later, it's very difficult to do, of course. But if you could harvest that ice, you would have water to drink, you would have air to breathe, because you could take away some of that oxygen from the H2O, and you would have fuel to burn because basic rocket fuel is hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, so that's, this is a, a billion dollar industry we're talking about. NASA has already put a price on it, on this ice. Uh, they will pay uh, $500, uh, kilo, $500 a kilogram for the ice. That's how valuable it is to them. So what could you do on the moon when you're there? 
um, science, lots, lots of science, astronomy, geology, lunology, if you will, and biology. So let me get back to the ISS. And I know this is sacrilegious in some uh, cultures here, <laughs> some circles, but uh, I think, not that anyone's listening to me, but I think we should make the moon the next ISS. Um, I think, uh, and we could do this with NASA's budget that it applies to the International Space Station of $4 billion a year. I think, it could I think NASA could apply that budget to the moon, to function on the moon, and then hand over the International Space Station to commercial interests. You know, this isn't surrender. This is a good thing, you know, because they have done, NASA and its partners have done so well, learning so much about working in space. Now it's time to hand it over to the commercial uh, aspect, uh, the commercial people, and let them further develop this. Why NASA and government entities move to the moon and push the next frontier? This is really important because there's some very important biology we could be doing. Let me go up to the next slide for a second and, and explain. You know this gravity issue. Um, I keep on harping about gravity, but you know we only have two data points when it comes to gravity. We know that one g is good. It's healthy. It's you know I, we guess that's what we evolved in. And zero G is bad, we know that. We knew that back from the, the Mir uh, space station. But how do these two data points connect? Is it a linear connection? Maybe it needs to need uh, a little bit of gravity for relatively good health, or maybe you need a whole lot of gravity uh, before you, you can have good health. We don't know. So by living on the moon and doing your experiments on the moon, you can at least add a third data point to this chart. And that'll give you some indication of what Mars is gonna be like. Okay, let me go back. I love this image because it, it shows things that are both practical and impractical. You know, I talked about the infrastructure idea, right? So here you see, this is ESA's idea. They want, to, before humans even get there, they wanna land and, and build habitats. And it will be done by, you know, you land these things that look like these airlocks here. And then the end of the airlock, it expands into kind of an igloo type shape, okay, made of like rubbery Kevlar. And then another robot comes out and covers the thing in regolith, about three or four meters worth. You need a lot because the moon, again, doesn't have an atmosphere. So there's no protection from the cosmic radiation and the solar radiation and even micrometeorites that are constantly hitting the moon. So you have to cover it up with a lot of regolith. And uh, that could be done before humans even get there. You can also use some robots to start generating oxygen. The, the moon actually has lots of oxygen. <laughs> the, the soil, the, the regolith is 40% oxygen by weight. It's just that it's bound to other minerals like, uh, like uh, iron, but you can bake that out for your oxygen supply. And we could be doing that in advance before people get there just to dance around and plant a flag. I have no idea why NASA wants to rush people back there. So that's the practical aspect of this. You know, the, young, the <laughs> what's not practical, I mean, it makes for great space illustrations, but this idea of growing uh, plants under glass, you see it all the time. I just said that humans had to be under three or four meters worth of regolith <laughs> or let's get killed by the cosmic rays. So I just don't know how plants can survive in such radiation under glass. There's even a couple people, if you look closely enough in here, <laughs> they're gonna get fried by the radiation. It's ridiculous. Uh, you're gonna, if you're gonna grow food on, on Mars, you're gonna have to grow it under LED lights, excuse me, on the moon. Okay, we talked about gravity. Here's another big thing about the, the moon you have to be aware of if you're gonna, if you're gonna go, and that's the dust. Uh, not many people talk about this, but it's really menacing. It's uh, these razor sharp particles. It's a bit like asbestos um, and it's everywhere. It actually levitates a few inches above the surface of the moon in these electrostatic fountains. So just by going out and walking around, you pick up this dust. And then if you bring it back in and breathe it in, it'll, it'll rip up your lungs. It's, it's deadly stuff and, it, and you can't escape it. It's like living on the moon essentially be like living in an asbestos remediation zone <laughs> forever. You know, There's no getting rid of this dust. It's always gonna be there. So that's, that's a real challenge to overcome that not that many people are talking about. So keeping that in mind, I, I wanted to throw this out. This is kind of fun, you know, moving about on the moon, keeping, you know, with all the dust, you know, these moon buggies that are kicking up dust, it probably won't be the way to go. An interesting way is with these gondolas. Um, it would be 
relatively straightforward to build. You just need some poles and cables because the gravity is so low, they don't need much support. <laughs> and because there's no air resistance, these things could fly along the cables. That would be a fun way to travel around on, this, on the moon, I think. Um, and here's an interesting idea about where to live if we're moving away from the polar regions where the temperatures are extreme. Again, the space artists come in and they, they, they build these wonderful golden lit domes, um, but it would be very hard to have material that can withstand I mean, you're essentially in Fahrenheit going like minus 250 to a positive 250 each month, 500 degree change. I mean, that, that's hard to maintain structure. So to get around this, we might end up living in caves and the moon has lots of them uh, carved out by, um, uh, by lava. This is a real image and it's about hundred meters deep. And just like caves on earth, these would have a constant temperature of about uh, minus 20 degrees, cold, but workable. And uh, you could hide down in here, build a little habitat down here, it'll give you the natural protection you need from the, the mi micrometeorites and the radiation. And you know maybe you can come out during the dawn or the dusk when it, before the temperatures get too uh, bad. That's how the Apollo astronauts, they were on the surface of the moon during either the dawn or dusk before the temperatures were too extreme. Um, we can talk about mooning, uh, excuse me, mining, <laughs> mining the moon. Uh, in the uh, uh, in the question period because it's it's pretty extensive. But if you're interested, it's uh, you know you need a market. That's the problem. Lots of valuable stuff on the moon, but there's no market just yet. That's the gist of it. Um, but you know, actually, before mining, I think tourism is a real possibility. Um, you know, so, so Baron Hilton had this idea in 1967. He was going to build a, a hotel on the moon, and lots of people called him a visionary. I, I think he might have been naive uh, and his, you know, I think this is exemplified by his perception of uh, Venus, uh, excuse me, Saturn by looking out the barroom window. It's not going to be that big. Maybe if you're drunk, I don't know. Um, but, um, but this is feasible tourism on the moon. It all comes down to the price, really. I mean, right now it'll cost maybe $15 million to get to the moon. In fact, SpaceX wants to uh, send seven people around the moon. Um, for about that price. But if you could get the price down to a million dollars, which I think is feasible in 10 or 15 years, if you could get the price down that low, you would have tens of thousands of people wanting to go to the moon. Uh, that's a real uh, uh, market. That's the beginning of, of, uh, of an industry. And, and if you could get that even cheaper, you may be in 20 or 30 years down to $100,000, well, I think there's people on this, uh, in this listening to this talk right now that would do that. Um, they would take out loans or, or save up for this trip of a lifetime. So I, I think lunar tourism is a real possibility, but I don't think this will happen. <laughs> Cities on the moon, <laughs> because it won't happen because there's no reason for it to happen. Just like, you know, no one is living uh, on uh, Mount Everest and no one's living in Antarctica. It's just not very practical. Uh, I mean, I'm sure one or two nuts would like to go and live there. But what would drive tens of thousands of people to form a city on the moon in this gray existence uh, where you probably can't have children because the gravity is so low and, and you can never go outside? You can't go outside on the moon. Even when you're outside, you're in, in you know, a big uh, bulky space suit. So you would never be able to smell the moon or, or taste the moon or feel the moon or, or even hear the moon, you know, there's no sound <laughs> that travels. You might as well experience the whole thing in virtual reality. I, I can't see any reason, I mean, sure to work on the moon, but to actually set up at your lifetime on the moon and generations on the moon, uh, it, it seems to be no purpose to it. But that's not the case with Mars. You know, there's a real possibility here because um, it's intriguing, objectively, subjectively, but maybe objectively, it, 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 it's far more beautiful than the moon. I mean, it has, a colorful sunsets and sunrises, uh, fantastic mountains and canyons. Um, I mean, just real color to it. And uh, it's so Earth-like. Even the day-night uh, cycle is about 24 hours, incredible coincidence. And it has a tilt just like Earth. So there's, there's actually seasons, four different seasons on, on Mars. And it's every element we need for life. Um, the, the question of gravity is an open-ended question, of course, because if 38% of Earth's gravity, which is what Mars is, 
If that's not enough to raise children on Mars, well, that's the end of co uh, uh, colonization. You know, case closed. You can't raise kids there. <laughs> you can't colonize a place. Maybe it will be a science uh, basis, maybe, you know, retirement community. But unless the gravity is suitable uh, for children, then you will never be able to colonize it. But that's for later to find out. The big question now, the big issue now is how to get there because it's a long trip. You know, it's, it, we're talking nine months in, in, a, in, a, um, in a spacecraft. That's a long time to be out sea. Um, no one has ever done that actually. You know, I looked it up with, um, with seafarers. You know, the longest uh, sea voyage seems to be about three months. And that's with when Magellan was going around the whole globe and there was a point in the Pacific between, you know, looking for islands that these guys were out in the ocean for three months looking for land. That's a long time, but we're talking uh, nine months here. And you're going, you're traveling, of course, through this soup of radiation. It's very deadly. Once you get out of the Earth's atmosphere and the protective magnetosphere of the Earth, it's, it, you know, you're, you're a sitting duck out there. Um, in fact, you know, when the Apollo astronauts went to the moon, they all experienced flashes in their eyes. And what these flashes were, were cosmic rays going through their eyeballs and interacting with the molecules and fluorescing. And they would get this at a rate of once every few minutes. So if, if that's happening every, uh, at that rate, you can imagine that every second, these cosmic rays are, are slicing through your body, uh, ripping apart your DNA. I mean, this, this is like cancer waiting to happen. This is a, a real issue. And, and people are unsure whether we could actually survive the trip to Mars. You either have to get there as quickly as possible, you know, a couple of weeks, which seems to be impossible right now, um, or have some serious radiation protection. And that's complicated because these cosmic rays, they're, they're atomic bits of matter from beyond the solar system, um, from star explosions, moving at nearly the speed of light. They're very hard to, um, to protect yourself from. Uh, on Earth, we have a magnetosphere and it's a because these particles are charged, they approach our magnetosphere and then go around it. They don't go into it. Um, so, but when you're on a spaceship, you don't have much protection. Now, a bit of a hope here is something called a boron nitrite uh, nanotubes. Um, this can be made into this fluffy material you see here. You can insulate the spacecraft with it. Uh, and you can even ins insulate your clothes with it. And boron is interesting. It's a good absorber of what we call secondary cosmic rays. So, so when that cosmic ray hits the hull of the space uh, uh, craft, it'll create a cascade of, of slightly less energetic secondary particles, sort of like shrapnel. Um, and the boron is very good at capturing that, uh, those secondary particles. So that's some hope, some protection, but it is a dicey proposition. And the other problem is the gravity. I keep on getting back to gravity. I think it's tantamount to homicide, really, to send astronauts uh, to Mars like the plan is in zero gravity. I mean, we know what nine months on the International Space Station is like. You, you lose all control of your muscles when you get back to Earth. You have to be carried out of the spacecraft. Who's going to lift you out of the spacecraft once you get to Mars for the first people to get there? Uh, so, you know, I've been talking about this artificial gravity concept, and you might know it, it you know, if you have, it's like when you have water in a bucket, right? And if you spin that bucket over and over around your head, the water is not gonna fall out as long as you keep on moving it fast enough, right? It's as if an artificial gravity is pinning the water to the bottom of the bucket. Well, that can happen in space too. And it, it's not that complicated um, to try to do this if we ever wanted to test it. Imagine a spacecraft that once it gets out in the space, it separates uh, and it gets remains tethered by a cable that you see here. Maybe. Um, it's not to scale, but you know, like a kilometer or two kilometers long, the longer the better. And then you fire the engine so that one starts going over the other all the way to Mars. You can create an artificial gravity of Earth-like gravity or even Mars-like gravity or somewhere in between. You could be doing that all the way to Mars. Um, hey, it was an engineering feat, but it, it's something it, it can be done and probably has to be done if we're ever gonna travel through the universe or uh, through the solar system anyway. Um, okay, landing on Mars, that's a bit <laughs> a dicey proposition. We saw Mars 2020 land, it was only a, a ton. 
And uh, you know, we were, there's a big nail biter, but some of these missions that we're talking about of sending humans, we're talking 20, uh, 20 tons. And, and Elon Musk wants to send these massive spacecraft that are 100 tons. We don't know how to land that on Mars without uh, crashing. So that's why Mars is really, our destination is you know 20 years down the line here. We have to figure that out before we go. Um, but here's an idea. Uh, it may be that if we're gonna send lots of people to Mars, thousands of people, uh, the way to go may be, be with like a ferry system. Uh, these ferries that actually stay in space that never land on Earth or Mars. In this picture, you can see the sun in the middle. And this ferry would be something um, that, you know, it'll take you closer to Mars and then closer to Earth, closer to Mars and closer to Earth, around and around again. So when that ferry comes, you catch it, you, you jump up uh, with a shuttle and, and get onto that ferry. And then in this trajectory, you can get to Mars in about five months, which is you know the fastest yet, right? Um, and then you kind of hop off light, uh, you're not with a big spacecraft. Uh, you can throw your cargo down there. It doesn't matter if that crash and burns, but um, you, know, you, you get off as lightly as possible and get down to Mars and then uh, without any people, the shuttle returns. At this point, the planets are farther apart, so it's going to be about a year and a half to get back. Uh, but when it gets back every two years, you, more people can get on the ferry or two ferries. That might be the way to go. Um, okay, so now here's the problem with Mars. It's beautiful. That's a big problem. Looks like Arizona. It's so beautiful that it uh, looks easy. And it's not easy uh, to live there. It's not something you can conquer so easily. There are two problems with this, um, this photograph. One uh, is our old friend, uh, uh, plants under glass, uh, <laughs> but for slightly different reasons. Um, the sunlight is powerful enough. It's like the, the angle of the sun in Scandinavia once you're on Mars, but it's the dust storms. That's a real problem. The dust storms on Mars block out the sun for weeks or months at a time. Uh, it's such a problem that actually solar panels are not reliable. You have to have a backup energy source on Mars because the sun will blot out the sun. I mean, the, the dust will blot out the sun. It's that simple. So if, if, that's, if you can't rely on solar panels, you can't rely on photosynthesis. Uh, if you want food, you're going to have to grow it under LEDs. The other problem is this guy over here in this space suit that looks pretty comfortable. It's kind of form-fitting. You can even see his butt a little bit, you know? And uh, it looks like he's just out there for a hike. It looks pretty cool. But it's not going to be that way, unfortunately. Here's another spacesuit. This is an engineer at MIT. Um, uh, Deva, can't remember her last name. Um, she, she's been trying to get a, a, um, a more comfortable spacesuit. And then it looks great. It was built by an you know, Italian design firm. Um, but it's really not that practical because you have to remember the atmospheric pressure on Mars is only six millibars, which is pretty close to the moon's zero millibars and not even close to the Earth's 1000 millibar of pressure. So our spacesuits on Mars are probably gonna look like a lot like we have on the moon, these big bulky things where it's hard to grab everything. And that's a shame, <laughs> you know, that's a big problem we would have to overcome Otherwise, it's not gonna be much fun to be on Mars in those big bulky things. Um, and, and the same radiation problem really on the moon uh, with your um, habitats. You might not have to be in a covered with regolith though. Actually, because Mars has water, you could use the Martian water to um, fill a membrane uh, and use the water as the protection. Water actually protects better you know, per volume than um, the regolith because it's denser. So that would be a, a good way to protect yourself, um, but it will be somewhat of a translucent existence looking out. Uh, my idea, again, not that anyone's listening to me, um, but I think you should build a habitat into the side of a mountain, like the northern slope on the uh, uh, northern hemisphere. That way, you know, the mountain would block out 100% of the solar radiation, and Mars itself would be protecting from the cosmic rays coming from all different angles except for the front. And, but this way you could have a big, nice window so you can see beautiful Mars. That's a huge psychological lift. Imagine going all the way to Mars and living underground or in some translucent world. Um, that's, and because you can't go outside that often because of the radiation. So you need a real psychological lift to be there. This is what Earth looks like from Mars. So it's pretty lonely. 
um, when you're on Mars. Here's another kind of psychological lift, uh, lift generating oxygen. Um, so, uh, you know, there's an instrument on Mars now called uh, MOXIE uh, that was just there with the Mars 2020 rover. And that's going to generate oxygen by pulling in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and producing oxygen from that, uh, the O in the carbon dioxide. Um, and that's probably our main way to generate oxygen on Mars. But here's a, a complement to that. This is being built by the University of Arizona. I went out to visit them when I was writing my book. And this is lightweight, it's expandable, um, and it's made of aluminum. And using LEDs, they are growing um, and harvesting 1,000 kilocalories of uh, food every day, and more importantly, generating 100% of an adult's oxygen needs. So that would be pretty cool that everyone on Mars gets one of uh, one of these things. <laughs> I like to say you can have your air and eat it too. Um, because uh, farming is going to be difficult. Here's Mark Watney uh, from the movie The Martian. Great movie, great book. I'm not ripping it apart. Uh, sensational uh, book. Uh, but there are two things wrong with this picture. Um, one is a bit of a nitpick. You know, I'll tell you the truth because I, you know, I grow potatoes. Um, he probably wouldn't be able to do it under these artificial lights that he has. They're not strong enough. Probably be able to grow the greens, but not the big tubers that he has. Again, a nitpick. But the real issue is that the soil is, is toxic, unfortunately, um, that uh, it contains perchlorates. So the potato growing in it would absorb the perchlorates and Watney eating those potatoes would probably die after a couple months of eating all those perchlorates. Uh, so if you're gonna uh, farm directly into the regolith, you're gonna have to uh, clear out those perchlorates somehow, which is feasible, but when you're talking about acres of farmland, it'll be very tedious. So probably best to grow hydroponically, aquaponically on Mars. But to tell you the truth, everything's going to be difficult on Mars. That's why it's, it's so far away, 20, 30 years before we get there. Major advancements we need on all types of uh, aspects we can talk about later. But here's an end game for some, like um, uh, Elon Musk, to have thousands of people on Mars. Uh, definitely feasible from an engineering point of view. Definitely feasible from an emotional point of view. I can see people wanting to do this. I would want to go there. Absolutely. Um, it's the economic issue. Uh, you know, is this feasible from an economic point of view? Because what you see here, these thousands of people, when you think about it, they're a bunch of moochers, aren't they? You know, I mean, what are they giving back to Earth? What you're seeing here is a, a trillions of dollars in one way investment. This is a migration like never before, as I was saying. I mean, this is not old world, new world scenario where the new world can send back uh, timber and fur and fish um, and, and have some real trade going on. Mars really has very little value aside from some novelty goods to trade back. So this is pure one-way investment funded by, I guess, Earth taxpayers uh, for trillions of dollars. And how are we going to tolerate that just to send a few thousand lucky people to Mars uh, for what, a grand human experiment? You know, that sounds nice, but uh, how practical is it? I have to be honest. But let's, let's put some numbers on this. Um, you know, this, um, this idea uh, of, of, of Wendigo comes from um, uh, Freeman Tyson, the physicist who just died a few years ago. So he figured, you know, between Columbus and the Mayflower, you know, that first big voyage and then the migration, 128 years passed. And a lot of shipping technology uh, happened during that period. Well, if you view Sputnik as kind of that first voyage, uh, and you add 128 years to that, we're talking about maybe colonists, maybe people can go there by 2085. That's curiously an interesting date. Maybe that would be the target date where uh, migration could take place on Mars if the gravity permits it. Um, but now think about the cost, though. <laughs> that Mayflower voyage cost about seven and a half uh, years worth of wages. And right now to get to Mars, you're talking about $10,000 worth of wages. So you're going to have to get that cost way down. You know, if we could get Mars down to a voyage down to a million dollars, uh, about 10 years worth of wages, maybe you could have migration going on, but it's going to come down to the money. That's the economic, that's the reality of it, isn't it? Okay, people ask me about terraforming Mars, and it's difficult. And uh, we can talk about that in the question and answers. It's not science fiction, but the, the, the 
the main way to do this, of course, is to liberate all that carbon dry ice, that carbon dioxide underneath the foot, get it up into the sky for an atmosphere, but there's just not enough of it. And you're gonna have an atmosphere that's only about 100 millibar, that's still not suitable for any kind of uh, higher level life. Um, so you'll never be able to run around naked on Mars, which of course would be my goal. Uh, and that's a real bummer. Um, you know, at that point it becomes science fiction to import volatiles, import uh, nitrogen from uh, Uranus and you know, all that stuff and skim an asteroid over the top of the atmosphere to liberate stuff. Yeah, good luck with that. Um, so it's a shame, but it's a good, it's worth trying because every bit of millibar uh, will help uh, foster some kind of life that could grow naturally on Mars. I'm all for it. Um, but that's it, my friends. <laughs> Uh, that's Mars with its um, with its uh, relatively high gravity. The only thing that comes close to it is Mercury with 38% gravity, uh, similar to Mars. Uh, and you could live on that. You know, there's a it's the hottest planet in the universe, but the face that's not the part that's not facing the sun is the coldest. And there's a line in between that if you could stay there as it's rotating, you could stay in a dawn or a dusk. You could live on Mercury. Uh, why? I, I don't know, but you can. <laughs> and Venus, you could actually live comfortably on Venus above the atmosphere uh, in, in the temperature, pressure, and gravity similar to the Earth. It's the most comfortable place in the solar system uh, around a planet. Uh, but again, why would you do this? Um, it's actually not an accurate picture here from NASA because you'd probably be in the clouds. So you wouldn't be able to see above and below you. It's kind of a few <laughs> pretty poor existence. Uh, you could live inside an asteroid. You know, some of these things are size of a mountain and you could carve that out and have a rotating habitat inside there. And with a kick, uh, with some fusion fuel, you could kick yourself off and travel to uh, Alpha Centauri at 10% light speed. So you could technically get there in 40 years. That's a, a generation, <laughs> that's a lifetime. Um, that's pretty exciting. Um, we can talk about that in the question and answers. But every place else, you know, it just gets harder and harder with uh, radiation and extreme cold. Um, you know, actually, uh, it'd be fun to look for life out there, especially on um, Enceladus, uh, because I think that's the real place that might have uh, life, because not only is there that subsurface ocean, but there are geothermic vents that could actually provide food for any microorganisms that are there. Um, I won't, so I can find a way to live on any of these planets. Some people actually want to live on Titan because it's kind of an atmosphere. Uh, it's the only place in the uh, universe, uh, solar system that has an atmosphere like uh, Earth. Um, so you don't need a pressure suit, hooray. But you need a parka, <laughs> pretty thick parka because you're talking about 100 minus, minus 180. Um, Pluto and Charon, you could you know, actually link those two together because they always have the same face to each other. That would be fun to do. But all these crazy grand ideas, they don't make much sense because of something um, that Isaac Asimov uh, came up with, this idea of terrestrial chauvinism. Why would we live on these rocks? Why do we have to live on a rock? Why wouldn't we live in an orbiting um, habitat that has artificial gravity and climate control? That's the logical thing we're going to be doing. Look at this place. It has, has patio furniture, for Christ's sake. Wouldn't you rather live here than on some ice hut in, on uh, Jupiter's moon Europa? I mean, it's far more comfortable. And then if you're living in these kind of units, you could go down to the, the planets and the moons you want to explore for a few days and then get back to comfort. This is what I think is in our future. You know, we're going to have science bases on the moon. We're going to have possible colonies on Mars if the gravity permits it. Uh, but other than that, I think we're going to be in orbiting habitats uh, so that it would enable us to go to the more rugged places for a few days at a time, but not actually live in those places again in the same way we don't choose to live on Mount Everest. And my last point is why would we want to do this? So I see two futures in front of us here. And um, one is this idea uh, that there's no space activity. If we listen to these people and say, why do we spend billions of dollars in space? So if there's no more space activity, then we, this is a world of finite resources and that every person born in another country, that's your enemy. That's a person who's gonna steal your resources away. And there's lots of people out there. There are people in these countries, of course, they wanna drive, they wanna have cars, they wanna have iPhones, they wanna have these materials. 
And there's gonna be a constant fight over these kind of resources that produce these things. That's one kind of future. The other future is this daily access to space to tap in to the infinite resources. And if we could do that, that means every person born on this planet is a resource himself or herself that they can contribute to this wealth of knowledge to make life better. So that's why I'm in favor of space exploration to make life on earth better for all of us. So that's it, thank you for your time. Let me stop sharing. Frank gave me instructions to say, stop Hi, sharing. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, the, you brought up a tremendous number of, of, of points. Um, I really liked um, your comments in the beginning that were uh, sort of taking the manifest destiny type idea of why we would go out to space rather than the, because it's absolutely necessary to save life on earth. Um, and then you sort of finished it with a, um, a, the same counterpoint to it that, you know, that um, if we do go out there, it, 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 to, make, to make our lives better um, would be the, one of the ways that we would do that, uh, one of the reasons for doing it. Um, so I, I want to actually ask a question about one of the points you made partially through, and that colonization, you know, when, we call, when, when countries colonized uh, here on Earth was driven by access to raw materials that, that could be shipped back home. Uh, and the strongest argument people usually make is about asteroid mining, which you didn't mention. What do you think of that in terms of a way of, of getting raw materials? I, I think it's wonderful. And it all comes down to the price of access to these, um, to these objects. And so, you know, if we could do that, um, and we could, if we could mine space and we wouldn't have to mine on earth. I mean, mining is so important, but it has incredible environmental costs. Let's face it, especially things like uranium and cobalt and these rare earth minerals that aren't particularly rare, but they're just so hard to get uh, from the earth and they cause incredible damage. If we could get them cheaply from space, um, that would just be a wonderful resource. And we could allow people in, in an ironic kind of way to live primitively, because what we're doing is we're just tearing up the rainforests. We're, we're, we're tearing up places where indigenous people live um, just to get those resources. This was just in the news today about Greenland. This beautiful Greenland is getting torn up by this uranium mine and it's jobs, but it's, you know, it's, it's ruining Greenland. If we could get these materials from space, we could allow people to live like they've always lived for thousands of years. Uh, but still have the resources we need to live a modern life. It would be like this balance between primitivism and modernism, but it's all about the, the cost to get to these, uh, these, these rocks in space or the moon. Yeah, uh, there, there are plenty of philosophical arguments for the things, but the economics really does, it ends up trumping all. So we're gonna bring in Grant Justice. Uh, Grant has been monitoring the chat. We've had, I've been looking at the chat a bit myself and we've had a, ton of conversation <laughs> about a lot of things you know somebody goes oh wait a minute isn't mars soil toxic and then you know three minutes later boom you bring up the point mars soil is toxic uh so grant have you found some some good questions in our chat here today absolutely the chat like you said has been has been popping off today so one of the you touched on it a little bit, but the chat definitely wants you to elaborate a little more on your thoughts on SpaceX and private industry and space exploration, kind of bringing it back to our economics point you just made. Absolutely. It's, it's a real exciting time. Um, I think that it's, it's basic economics. The more competition you have, um, you know, the lower this price can be. And and it's nice to see all types of niches getting filled in. I didn't mention anything about um, Rocket Lab down in New Zealand. Um, this is a company, New Zealand doesn't even have a space program, and yet they have a company launching these simple rockets. Um, they're going small, and they're, march they're launching a rocket um, for about $5 million. You could buy that rocket, and, and people can team up and put uh, their nanosat experiments in there, these lightweight things, and get that into space. That's one very profitable thing. 
And that can build a bit of an infrastructure of miniature communication satellites and things like that. It all adds up and what SpaceX is doing with the big stuff um, and other companies are competing finally to get a, a lunar lander. That kind of competition is thrilling to see because it's just been so lazy, you know, with governments handing it over to military contractors and there was no incentive to, to uh, innovate, no incentive to save money. And it was so much has been wasted over the years. But now, because of this economic competition, um, you're finally seeing some real innovation uh, to make space more affordable. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> and yeah, absolutely. I think competition, I mean, it's at the heart of human nature. We got to harness it for the right reasons, for the right things. Um, second up, and this interested me a little bit as well, because it's something I hadn't necessarily thought about before. Uh, what about aquaponics and building on that, using water as some sort of a non-permeable uh, solution for blocking solar radiation? Yeah, no, I thought about that too. Um, uh, I think aquaponics is the most efficient of all the growing systems. And for people who don't know, you'd have the hydroponic system where you're growing plants in some nutrient rich water, right? Well, the aquaponics brings in this full cycle idea where you have fish that you feed, the fish produce, uh, they eat the food, they uh, produce waste, nitrogen uh, rich waste that gets filtered through some rocks and bacteria to turn the, I believe it's nitrates into nitrate, nitrites into nitrates or traits into trites, I'm not quite sure. But it's, they break it down, that uh, nitrogen into stuff that the plants can use and the plants absorb that uh, and then they feed the fish. So it, it's a cycle that goes around and it's very efficient. You could be eating the fish, raising and eating the fish and raising and eating the plants. Now you're bringing in this extra element of could you use that water <laughs> as radiation protection? And that's pretty cool, isn't it? Uh, if it's all around you, right? And, um, and that would definitely work for you, <laughs> but would it work for the fish? Cause they're swimming around in this radiated water. So it, it might be a little, little hard to pull off, uh, but it's very cool. And, and water is, is an excellent insulator. I mean, if I have to live on another planet underground or something, at least like sea lab or like underwater complex, like at least <laughs> give me something, you know? Exactly. Well, yeah. I mean, I mean now that's a huge psychological lift. So, you know, my previous book was called Food at Work. It's kind of an academic. It's about how to feed workers. And that was important in Antarctica um, because they were getting a lot of frozen food and there's not much crunch to the frozen food. So they actually started building greenhouses in Antarctica. And that was a huge psychological lift because during the winter, in the summer, you could get airplanes in there. In the winter, actually, you can't get planes in there. So to the mm -hmm. South Pole. So they were growing fresh food on the South Pole, fresh lettuce, and it has that crunch. And it was a huge psychological lift for these people there. And I think it's gonna be very important on Mars and to have fish, to have life. Uh, one other thing you didn't mention is, it is curious, you don't know how bees and certain uh, insects could navigate on Mars without a magnetic field in a, in a North Pole. So it's, it's uns clear whether they could fly around and, and find their direction. Um, so that's why I said our agriculture will be challenging, um, but the more animals you can get there, the more greater the humans will feel. Yeah, that was one of the comments was that um, you know, the lack of a magnetosphere on Mars will change, uh, will have, will have several uh, implications like that uh, for the radiation as well. Um, but uh, yeah, the navigational, of uh, birds and bees and everything. Yeah, you would have to maybe hand pollinate things. It, it's gonna be small scale. Maybe the bees can adapt. We don't know if, if it's in a small confinement, maybe they can find their way around that way. It's an unknown, exciting. Yeah, I would just comment that um, it, none of the pictures of living on the moon that I ever, ever saw when I was growing up had them living in caves. <laughs> so oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's one of those unfortunate uh, realities that, that comes across. <laughs> All right, what's our next question, Grant? 
All right. Um, next up is someone wanted to know your opinion on AI and using artificial intelligence in the expansion of humanity to take over a lot of the clerical, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how to narrow in on that question, but I, I can say a few things. I always thought it was funny when we talk about living in space and what are these people, what are we going to do out there? And it always comes down to farming and mining, you know, the two oldest professions. That's what we're going to do in the future, farm and mine, when it's probably going to be done robotically <laughs> uh, with, with robots, in, rather intelligent robots. Uh, that's one form of, of, of AI that's definitely going to be needed. And I was mentioning that on, on Mars because, you know, with the rover, right, it's just inches along and you're afraid to move it too fast because if it crashes, you're screwed. And, and, and Mars is pretty open. It's not like it's gonna crash into a tree, right? So, you know, if we could, we need, really need better AI. I know it's rocks and things like that, but if it, can, if it can think for itself better, then these things can move around more easily without human interaction. So there's major advancements to be had there with AI. Um, to do things for us outdoors uh, when we're on these planets, because we're not going to be able to be outdoors very often because of the radiation. Right. And, you know, when we've got just one rover on Mars, uh, you can't take any chances with the AI. Um, but if you had 100 of them on, well, you could take a bit more chances with it. And, you know, if you lost one, okay, fine, we, you learn things. Uh, we are, of course, practicing that with our self-driving cars and everything. But, um, yeah, it's going to take decades, uh, quite some time. That's true. I've heard plans of, of having many, many ones uh, going out and all like, you know, like you just said, 100 little guys going out and, and doing all types of things. If you lose one, it's not too bad. All right, next question. We can't hear you, Grant. I'm back. <laughs> Next up, we've got uh, we've got one. What kind of energy production is known on Mars? Is there anything that we can use as fuel without necessarily bringing it ourselves? Uh, how do you really see that working there? Because you mentioned some sort of an issue with solar panels, you know, light collection. Um, that's right. There will be solar. Um, there is uranium and things. You could do nuclear on Mars. Um, I think, um, I don't have the chemistry down completely, but when you're converting um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, maybe Frank knows this, into oxygen, you're going to be producing carbon monoxide uh, in that process. And that could be a bit of a fuel too. There's also the possibility of adding um, hydrogen to this. Mars doesn't have much free hydrogen, it's in the water and such. But if you add hydrogen into the mix, then you could be making methane. Um, in fact, that was um, Robert Zubrin's uh, brilliant idea of um, sending a lander to um, start, and with some hydrogen, to start um, turning carbon dioxide into uh, air, water, and methane, and then storing up that methane as rocket fuel to blast off Mars so you wouldn't have to bring a shipment of uh, fuel to get off Mars. So definitely methane. Uh, is the most probable gas, I think. Okay. That's probably not a common problem people think of, is not necessarily getting there, but getting back or getting things off of Mars once you're already there. Yeah, and I like to think of Mars as having everything we need, but just in forms that we're not ready to use. So we have to manipulate a few things uh, for us to do what we want to do. So in terms of that, um, in one section of your talk, you sort of implied that what we've learned from ISS is sort of a practice that will help us do the moon. Uh, do you also feel that uh, doing the moon is, is, would, would provide sufficient practice for then going to Mars? Is it a requisite to do moon before Mars? Yeah, I'm one of those believers. I really think we have to be on the moon. It's, it's kind of the same thing. Um, it's a dress rehearsal for Mars, to tell you the truth. I mean, you essentially need the same type of radiation protection, the same type of oxygen supply, the same type of water supply. Everything's the same in, in, in my opinion. And of course the moon is three days away. 
could it be even faster if you, you know, you could send a, <laughs> a rocket there uh, and, and crash into it if you wanted to get there in eight hours or so, right? <laughs> uh, the Pluto Express passed uh, the moon in, in just about eight hours. Um, so, I mean, you could get to the moon rather quickly and you could vacate people rather quickly. In a funny way, it's actually, it'll be, it might be easier to get to the moon than to Antarctica in the winter. <laughs> uh, it's very uh, treacherous to get there uh, to the South Pole in particular in the middle of the winter. They don't even try it. But the moon is someplace you could probably access year round without, with less of an issue as long as you have a rocket ready to go. All right. Next question. That's all we've got from the chat so far. That's all we've got from the chat so far. Let me check my yep. note that I made during the talk. Um, yeah, all right. So you, you mentioned a lot of these uh, zero gravity repercussions that we've learned from the ISS. Um, and that would be, you know, slightly ameliorated on, on the moon with, you know, one sixth gravity, 16%. Uh, and then a little bit more on Mars with 38% gravity. Um, we to talk about creating artificial gravity in space as we're flying there, as we're traveling there. I, 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 Get if 38% gravity isn't enough for rep reproduction or anything or for, for kids and such, is there any alternative that it just bases around it, maybe, as you were talking about? Yeah, I really don't see it. I mean, people talk about these, you know, a tilt a wheel on the surface of Mars or something like that. <laughs> I mean, that's I mean, that's incredible engineering. I mean, it's just not logical. I, I like to think in my book, Spacefarers, I just talk about the logical scenario of what would probably happen. And if you have one set of technology, you would probably do something similar that's, that's easier. And it would probably be in the rotating habitat above Mars uh, and then venture down there. It would be easier than building some type of artificial gravity system on a surface of a planet. Um, and that's, a, that, and, and the gravity is a big, ex, 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 um, Assumption. I, I, that's why I was trying to point out those two data points. I, I don't think we can make any assumption about how those lines are connected. Wouldn't it be curious whether maybe you only need 10% of gravity? Maybe, you know, when you think about minerals and mining or stuff, it's very, it's impossible to mine in zero gravity because nothing is settling. But, you know, on, on asteroids or the moon, things eventually settle regardless of the amount of gravity. And so maybe human health is, is possible with, with just a little bit of gravity. I, I mean, it's pure speculation and you, you just have to test it. It's a shame there was a, a proposed mission, I think it's called Mouse Hab, where you would send mice into space cared for by a robot, right? Um, and uh, it's a real mission and it's, it seems quite practical. And it would have rotating gravity you know, artificial gravity, and it could have 50% 50, 50 and 30% and 10%. You could test it and see how the mice do going about their life. It's just a matter of feeding them and taking care of their change, uh, their, their cages. Not that complicated for a robot to do. Um, and then you could really test what it would be like uh, to see if they can um, reproduce and, and, and raise their, 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 their young. It'd be interesting to see the DNA changes. Yeah, that too. Yeah, yeah. You'd really, you'd, you'd, you'd almost want to be, make that a, 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 a return mission so that you could um, do the tests afterwards, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, yeah. I've got a good one to end us on. Okay. If I may. All right, go for it. All right. <laughs> I want to get this one. Okay. Does the exploration of deep ocean play a role in space exploration? How do you think it might affect moving forward? I don't know. I haven't thought about that. I know there's issues, there's legal issues of who owns the deep oceans and what you're allowed to take from there and, and what nations can benefit from that. And that's going to come up with the moon of who owns the moon and who's allowed to have these resources, who's allowed to dig at that ice and, uh, and take it away uh, from other people. Um, so I've seen that kind of issue come up with uh, the deep ocean. And um, so there might be something to learn from there. Um, other than that, I don't know. I, I've, I know there's this kind of a science fiction genre of living under 
under, under the ocean as a way to you know make more room for people on 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 the land. Um, but one thing it always gets glossed over is the fact that if you kind of have a uh, an area that you're living under, it'll probably be you know consumed by algae. <laughs> is this all going to be covered with gunk? You know, in a couple of weeks, and like every day, you would have to go out there and clean your beautiful golden lit dome underneath the ocean. Um, but I haven't I really, really don't thought like deeply about deep space. <laughs> really, really not a fan of domes. I'm getting thus far. Well, you know, I mean, you got barnacles. You know, you got to deal with them, right? <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. I mean, you got to be. I mean, there. This. I. I start off my book, Space Fairs, with talking about the space animators because they make it look so easy, <laughs> but it's really not that easy. Of course, they want to make it look easy. Everything just works perfectly and everything's clean, but the reality is, is really difficult. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. You've given our audience a tremendous number of things to, to, to think about. I um, hope that they will uh, go out and take a look at your book and uh, think of them, think, think through even more. Uh, next month, May 4th, we have the uh, Finding the Music of the Spheres, Hearing Stars from the Consonants Collective and the Bergamo Quartet from the Peabody Institute. It's going to be a special one, probably going to run a little long, uh, won't be limited to our 90 minutes here. Uh, and uh, thank you so much, Chris. Um, really great to have you here. And we'll see you next month, next month everyone. Thank you. It was a